Well, first off, my name's Kari Frazier. I'm a hip-hop artist. I'm from the city of Detroit. Now, most of my music is inspired by the city I live in. In this lecture, I'm going to kind of go into how Detroit is how I view Detroit. My father is a CPA, and he's been an entrepreneur my whole life, really. Uh, he started his practice when I was three years old, and since then, sometimes it's up, sometimes it's down. My grandfather owned one of the biggest nightclubs in Cleveland for about 30 years, and he was an entrepreneur, ground up, and that kind of affects the way that I see money, the way I see business, the way I see starting business. So as much as I socially love to take on any thought, I also feel that it's, it's a balance in the discussion, too. In this lecture, I'm going to kind of go through some of my songs. So I'm going to play some of my music and then talk about why it's that analysis. I'm going to talk about like some common economic terms that you guys are familiar with. Uh, and then some of you guys may not be familiar with. Who's an econ major in here? Okay, who's a business major in here? Okay, who, who appreciates economics? Okay, I believe it's an experiment and it's still working itself out personally. In this lecture, we're going to find out sometimes how it doesn't work out and how it does work out. The whole key to it is just showing that markets start creating themselves from things that you kind of don't expect the market to create itself from. This first song is called I Oh My. It was on uh, this album I released in 2009 with a member that's in my band. I have a band that's called General Population. My name is Peace. Uh, that's the artist that I did it with. So here's the song. Cause the second tour of it rock got them stressing While I try to get better People in the streets carrying concealed weapons And my mom's getting older And Detroit City push your blood pressure over Feel like that but a whole lot younger Praying for each other just to keep on going Well my brother on his knuckles Blew his bell out now we looking for a hustle on a K and a year gets spent like nothing How we grew up we just used to the struggle And my hood stay changing Seniors pass on grandkids is my neighbors My block stay alive like Vegas Man got strong armed over small paper On his front porch face to face with a banger Since then I ain't had a next door neighbor as we all lose hope, politicians get indicted, how can I vote? In my phone, been tapped, best friend facing fair time, caught up in the trap and he just had a son. We talk about that, avoid conversations that newspapers set. As I listen to the music, I don't even get the same feeling when I do it. Boy, I know the business, I wish I was clueless. About to be 30 and it all feel useless. But I hear the rhythm playing to see the reality of grandma singing. But I hear the rhythm playing to see the reality of grandma singing. I am I. Ask God for less, while thank you God for more. Reality's the same, couple bucks away from poor. More that I get, more I gotta pay for. Ask me for help, situation like yours. Cause I ain't never had nothing, I'm afraid of success. That's a different thing to some it put my heart in the off that nobody respect. When I tell you I'm a rapper, then you see me for less. Old family think I'm wasting time, I don't got left. So I think about survival and I dream success. As I script out lyrics while searching for the God in the next man's spirit Planning for my godson that's still an infant Born on my birthday, his life gon' be different Looking to the future with dreams of fulfillment While I got used to just living how I'm living like
All right. <clears throat> the song begins basically by starting talking about my cousin. That's uh, this is his second tour of Iraq. Uh, right now, he'll probably go on his third tour in Afghanistan sometime soon. I wrote this song in 2008. Um, the first thing that I that I kind of have is that the military pulls recruits from these poor neighborhoods, uh, big time. When I say big time, I mean there are military service officers at many of the schools, many throughout many of the communities, and the military is looked at as like a viable option for a career. Uh, this is a harsh consequence, I think, for many of the families because this already breaks apart a lot of the families. So, like a, a son or a daughter leaving to go, you know, hold a post. It could be anywhere. It could be Germany. It could be Afghanistan. It could be Iraq. But that already starts a tear. And uh, not to mention when people um, already have established their families. Uh, my, my grandfather, uh, uncles, uh, cousins, so many people I know have served so many tours within the military because it seemed as a legitimate option. Um, and then it's also kind of like a spin on how we look at creating, uh, like as I have this line, cousin's second tour of Iraq got him stressing while I try to get better people in the streets carrying concealed weapons. It's like my cousin is basically taking on and defending the country when in my own neighborhood, it's still a lot of things that are perpetuated through fear. Um, there's a strong accessibility to guns in the city of Detroit, which that is an economy as well. So one of the things that happens is that we live in a place where sometimes violence can seem very common, but violence seems a lot common because I think the fear is perpetuated. Every time we turn on the news, you see so many stories about who's been shot, how they've been shot, uh, what's happening that's wrong. Uh, almost every time you turn on the Detroit news, if anybody's ever watched the Detroit news, you're guaranteed to see some story of some tragedy. This perpetuates fear. That fear almost has become like an economy within itself because people want to see more and more of it on the news. People zero in on it. And I find that like a strange balance between we zero in on the fear in our own neighborhoods, but my cousin possibly could be in another place with those same weapons that we see as like adverse in our own community, dangerous in our own community, basically earning a paycheck. So it's like a weird analogy that I saw. Um, there's also a overwhelming idea of people carrying guns. Uh, strange thing is my, my mom and dad were actually at a CCW class the other day because my mom wants to get a taser. Uh, it's become an industry as well. And these are some of the things that I want to kind of point out in this discussion that sometimes what you don't expect to happen, meaning like you don't expect this to become an industry. You don't expect people to take advantage of it. You don't expect people to exploit it. There's always someone looking to exploit it. And when I use the term exploitation, sometimes people think like that's a bad term because you're trying to take completely take advantage of something. When I speak of exploitation, I'm just looking at it from a capitalist point of view, meaning that someone's looking to profit from this. You know, now if them profiting from it could possibly cause confusion so be it. Um, and like I say, if you have any questions or any points, you know, please, you know, I welcome any questions. Um, another thing in this is I have like two notes. Stevie Wonder wrote this song in 1982. It's called Frontline. And he's basically talking about a lot of the soldiers on the front line of Vietnam being black soldiers or poor soldiers from other communities, Latino communities, even white communities, white rural communities. A lot of the people that are in the military service are people in the lower class, people from Detroit, people that probably look at the military as not necessarily their first option, but a option that they want to take as opposed to living impoverished. And that's something definitely to talk about. Also, I have gun control down there. Licensing, use, accessibility, and prevalence. All of those are things that can tie into industries. Yes, sir, Dr. A. Uh, when people, uh, for example, in the community that you grew up in, when they come back from the military, have, has a sense of some values change from what the community holds as a, you know, is it perceived as a good thing to go into the military or just a, just an economic option, maybe one of the only ones that they have other than to go into some other kind of um, legitimate or illegitimate business? That's the, so that's one question. The second question is, 
Is there a sense of value change that's taking place because the military has laid on them a set of cultural values that may be different from where they came from? My cousin joined the military looking for money. My cousin didn't join because it's like, I want to represent the flag. I want to defend my country. I don't know that many people that are getting in the military because they look at it like this is something to do with pride. They look at it like this is the best job I can get in like a last chance opportunity. And I know I can get an opportunity here as opposed to saying being here, sitting in a college course or um, saying that I know it's enough opportunity here to find work if I want to find work or if I want to start my own business. The military is seen as like a last ditch effort of worst case scenario, I can become a Marine. Worst case scenario, I can get in the Navy. Worst case scenario, I can get in the Army. Or hopefully I can get in the Air Force. It's not seen as like, like you said, like wearing the flag. Um, and that kind of moves me to the second point of the, and my mom's getting older in Detroit City, push her blood pressure over, feel like that, but a whole lot younger, praying for each other just to keep on going. Detroit is recognized as the fattest city in America. That's just a real life situation. And nutritionists call it a food desert. They say that it is a crisis in Detroit when it comes to food. You know, I've been a big kid my whole life, you know, and it is some big people in the city of Detroit. You know, you can laugh at that. You can say, man, that's a grim reality. But a lot of it is just due to the opportunities and the options that you have. And when I say opportunities and options that you have, uh, a food desert is defined as basically within, within a 10-mile range, you should have a place where you should get what is considered healthy food. It's so many pockets of the city of Detroit where you're not getting that, meaning that Church's Chicken, Coney Island, and your grocery store is probably your party store, and a party store focusing on groceries is not going to focus on saying to themselves, let me make sure I have legitimate options. And this creates a weird thing as far as another economy within what happens within the healthcare industry in the city of Detroit. The healthcare industry and the hospitals in Metro Detroit, man, skyrocketing. I don't know if any of you all are in the medical field or want to Leverage your business with medical. But if you want to leverage your business with medical and you're focusing on hypertension, heart disease, diabetes, or heart attacks and strokes, Detroit will be a good place to probably set up shop. And people know this. You know, uh, the main thing that I want to key on is the dialysis centers in the city of Detroit. There are over 25 that I know of, but it's probably over 50 in the city. They're just that prevalent. Meaning that we don't have a major grocer. We don't have a Meyer. We don't have a Kroger. There's no more Farmer Jack. But we don't even have, I guess, if you consider Walmart a major grocer. It's no, within Detroit city limits, there are no major grocers. But you got 25 dialysis centers. And you'll see people go in there. I don't know if any of you all know someone with dialysis that has to go there to drain everything out and basically recharge themselves. Young and old, my grandfather, um, it would, it would be scary, you know, uh, to just see these dialysis centers. And it's one of the biggest businesses when it comes to medical fields in Detroit, I believe. I know two guys that run dialysis centers, and they're very, they're very good people. But they're still, their business is based, and they're taking advantage of a condition in the city of Detroit based on the nutrition in, that's accessible to most Detroiters. There is going to be a Whole Foods opening up in what is known as Detroit's Midtown, and that should be opening up next year, I believe. Uh, Whole Foods is going to provide a more nutritious option for food in the city of Detroit. But before this Whole Foods, and that's one of the, uh, that is one of the complaints about Whole Foods. Um, as he, you have a question? Okay. I'll tell, I'll tell you exactly in a second, but that's one, of the, that's one of the points. But I want you all, as someone in business, and we talk about a business ethics class, when we think ethics, sometimes we think about what's right and what's wrong. But when we think business, we have to think about profits. So sometimes that it's a, it's a thin line because is it right to basically take advantage of people's poor conditions? 
Or is it wrong to do that? I'm just letting you know that this industry does exist. And it's going to be on Woodward, uh, right next to where the Michigan State campus in Detroit is. So, I mean, it's not even meant for, you know what I mean? Like, it's not, like, this, this whole movement of, like, moving to Detroit where it's become trendy, right? To, like, mm -hmm. move to Detroit from the suburbs, um, which I think is great, right? Like, mm -hmm. but... Um, it's not meant for, like, the Soul Foods isn't meant for, like, the people who are living in Detroit right now, right? Like, it's meant for, like, it's meant for, like, the people who have, like, migrated to Detroit. Um, and it seems like it doesn't do anything to, like, remedy the problem, putting in a Whole Foods, if, like, you can't afford to purchase the food. You know what I mean? Like, I don't think it's going to do good. And... And, and that term is, I don't know if you all have dis discussed this in this class, but have you heard the term gentrification? Okay. So gentrification is the idea that you have a higher class of people, generally they'll say white people, move into what is like a Latino or black neighborhood as the Latino and black people were, quote unquote, pushed out of the neighborhood. Um, it's a debate. Some people have said that. Some people believe that. I personally think that this is where the entrepreneur in me says that I think every business deserves an opportunity to do business. But we as consumers and customers should have those options. So Whole Foods is expensive, I believe. I think that Trader Joe's would be great. But Trader Joe's doesn't look at Detroit right now, quote unquote, as the place to put their business. Uh, I, I also think that the migration to the inner city it is a lot of people that are coming and offering new ideas. Uh, I was in a discussion with this. I sit on this board because it's a lot of different people that I know. And the people from the board were talking about at the Mackinac Conference. Any of you all familiar with this Mackinac Conference that happens every year where you have a lot of the Michigan business leaders and they talk about things with politicians. And the, at the Mackinac Conference, there was specifically one of their lectures and conferences and seminars was built on young business people coming back to the city of Detroit that are multimillionaires and want to reinvest in the city of Detroit. Uh, one of the people that runs Slow's Barbecue, he was there. And Slow's Barbecue is a, I love that restaurant. The guy that owns it, real cool guy. Uh, my friend, that's my guitar player. He's been a bartender there for years. And I think that it provides options in the city of Detroit. And the more options we have, that's better for everyone. Because I wouldn't expect a business owner to take on the responsibility of wanting to make, ensure that one community gets healthy foods over another. I think that the only thing we can expect a business owner to do is to make sure that they make profit. You had a question? I was just kind of wondering, because it seems like a lot of the blame, well, not blame, but saying that like the dialysis centers mm -hmm. take advantage of the people mm -hmm. if the demand is created in a certain area why wouldn't they go there yeah i think people would complain a lot more if let's say they weren't there there were no dialysis centers then it would be like oh well they're not helping us and then when they are there they're taking advantage of them where's the happy medium of people accepting the change to have a different lifestyle to where there is no demand Okay, and that's where I said maybe I'll use another word other than exploit because or take advantage. They're taking advantage of business. I completely agree with you. I think that if you have a business, you should put it in the best place of business. What I'm presenting in this lecture, what I'm attempting to do is to show that when one domino falls one way, new markets open up. So the domino that fell is that you have a lot of fat people or people that are overweight, people that are suffering with these poor health conditions in the city of Detroit. As that domino falls down, you get dialysis centers. You get hospitals that specialize in hypertension and diabetes and heart disease, right? Just from one market not presenting itself, you get other markets that do present themselves. But it's also the consumer that creates the demand, right? And that's a discussion, too. Like, it doesn't cost money. Yeah, it does cost money to, it's more expensive to shop at Whole Foods, but it doesn't cost anything to jog around the block. Well, if we, and, and this is a discussion, you know, that, that's happening a lot in the city of Detroit. And more so what I'm presenting is that whole crisis of it is a food desert, too.
So if you live in a place within a 10 mile radius where you don't have the opportunity to go to a grocer that's outside of a party store and you do want to exercise and basically you have the option of jogging around the block, but there's no recreational center in your neighborhood either and you may not have access to transportation, it kind of puts you in a position where you're kind of in a rock and a hard place. Now that rock and that hard place may have been created by things that those decisions that you've made in your life before. And that is definitely the business person's argument. But I do also believe socially that because that rock and that hard place exists, some of the conditions almost like you're walking right into those conditions just based on like what options do you have? when the place that you buy your groceries from is the place where most people buy their liquor and lotto tickets from. So maybe they should... Try to move? Not buy so much liquor or lotto tickets, and maybe the demand would change towards better options. Possibly. Doc, Dr. A or... Oh, I don't remember what I was going to ask. Okay. I was just going to um, say, why, how, how would Whole Foods complement that type of environment if a... If a big mom or a grandma is so used to go to get her chicken wings from a different store, what's going to make her all of a sudden go get the organic chicken wings or the organic turnip greens to uh, cook? I just don't understand why, in, in business perspective, why a place like Whole Foods would go there. Well, because, uh, what's your name? Liz. Liz? Yeah. Well, Liz presented. There's right now a budgeting market for that. Right now, there is a... a new market for people around the city of Detroit, especially around that Wayne State market where I believe that Whole Foods will be successful. There are vegetarian and vegan restaurants in and around the area. What does that have to do with the obesity of the people in Detroit that were already there? Because isn't that what we're, isn't that what we're looking at? Aren't those the people that have to go to dialysis and the people that are having the heart True. True. When it, my point, which I guess I got to try to clarify a little bit more, was that I wasn't really focusing. I was saying that Whole Foods is going to be the first grocer to provide those foods in the city of Detroit, period. Because before Whole Foods is deciding to come next year, there was not a grocery option. And you can say either that the grocery option that did not exist is because of the options of the people, which some of it I do agree. Some of it I believe the people is their the people's responsibility. And some of it I believe it's the conditions responsibility. It's a hard sociological question to say, who do you blame? Especially when you're a child growing up in a home when you may not have the opportunity to decide what foods your mom buys or your dad buys. But if your mom and dad had an option, which now they do have an option like Whole Foods, it's a possibility that they may get that organic chicken. I don't know if the grandma is going to get the organic chicken, but now she at least has an option where it's like you can get the organic chicken or you can get chicken gizzard. You know, so at least the opportunity is there. I just want to you know, also comment like back to that whole issue. Like, I mean, there's, there's a couple things. Like, first of all, I lived in Linwood for like six years. You don't go jogging. I learned what you just don't. But like, it, when you don't have money, like you don't have time to exercise and all this stuff. But let's look at like, all right, what, what you're saying, like, there's something normatively interesting about like profiting off of, and you can call it exploitation, call it whatever. It is exploitation. There's something normatively like wrong, I guess, about profiting off of the suffering of others. But even take that, I, I know you're an entrepreneur, so you're like, mm. every business should have a chance to make money, to mm. do business. There's a political power and there's lobbying power that comes with money. Last year, yeah. they were actually talking about this at the Mackinac Conference last year. There was this initiative started with these co-ops, these farming co-ops from all over Michigan that were trying to buy land and make it like viable in Metro Detroit and, and start growing and create this like inner city uh, sustainability. Yeah, sustainability, create a healthy, non-hormone induced crops and create an inner city market for it and create local and jobs and stuff like that. The greatest lobbyists, like they were trying to get a startup of $3 million from Detroit, which is hard because there's no money there. But they, they, were, they were making headway, they were making progress. They were offering about like four or five million of their own. And then all of a sudden, you know, like the greatest lobbyists against that were the, were the uh, healthcare facilities within Detroit itself. 
This is a huge industry, as you were saying. It's a huge economy. So, like, and then they put the kibosh on that. You could have had this, like, state subsidized, or city subsidized and state subsidized, like, uh, organic market that, like, kept, that took EBT cards, that kept, like, prices low, that created, like, an actual economy within Detroit, that created jobs, too, with a little bit, like, three million is a lot in Detroit, but it's also kind of a pittance. And it was going to happen, and then it got killed by the healthcare industry. Hmm. So, like, not only is it, like, normatively wrong to, like, exploit some, or, like, an industry like that, like, this, you know, this, like, emaciated conditions in Detroit, but it's also wrong then use that political power, which always comes from it, to further perpetuate that cycle. And that's what these dialysis, like, 25 dialysis stations, they're continuing to do that. Yeah. It's just not laissez-faire. There, yeah. is, there is political power that's influenced by money, so. Yeah. It's just not markets. By themselves, there's a reason why they're cannibalizing Detroit. Yeah. Oh, let me say this. I, I'm I'm amazed. I love this discussion. I, I I gotta say, you guys are like provide a lot of different options. So, Doctor A, you're right. This class is on point. So I'm I'm enjoying this as much as hopefully you all are enjoying this. Question: If they have the cash to be able to start up something like this, could they provide an option? You know, like. Uh, a food, uh, a restaurant, or a uh, supermarket, a small place that you can get takeout or something that can provide a, a tasty and healthy kind of food that people in the neighborhood would enjoy buying, but at but would be better for them and make it something that everybody wants. I mean, it seems like as an entrepreneur, that's the kind of thing you would be looking for. Um, this is what uh, these huge um, corporate structures, you know, whether it's Church's Chicken or KFC or what, you know, yeah. uh, the fast food joints, but they're not concerned about people's health the way that a small entrepreneur who could go in and provide a service and a product to people could do for people in a certain neighborhood. It would be huge risk uh, financially, whether it would work out or not. But that seems like, from an entrepreneur's point of view, exactly the kind of risk they would want to take. You know, if in a single block or a couple block radius, there's, you know, five or seven fast food joints that are going to put people into the di into dialysis or heart condition before long, the entrepreneur would go in and say, let's see if we can provide a healthy, uh, alternative that people would like just as much as going to the fast food chain, which doesn't care, is only concerned about making profit uh, nationwide or worldwide, but that would provide a service and a product that is good for people and they would want to have and is reasonably priced and all these things, and then you would have, you know, created a better mousetrap, as they say, you know, build a better mousetrap. Good point. Um, as a business major, kind of spinning off of what you said, I agree. I, as someone who is going to start a business, is there a market? Absolutely. Absolutely. There's no one else doing what you're doing. Is there a demand for it? I don't know because I, I would see it as a huge financial risk. I would have to have so much capital to back this company for a long period of time because the demand would have to grow. It's going to be something that people are going to have to get accustomed to, and people are so conditioned to eating the way they do in Detroit that for people to want that kind of food and to choose that sort of healthy alternative, no matter how good it is, it's going to take a while to get the sort of positive response to have a profitable company, like you were saying. So I think it would, it would be a great thing, green market, green light go, because you would have absolutely no competition you know, at first, but you would need to be able to back your company for a very long time to make a profit for people to get accustomed to eating that way or demanding that type of food. Yeah, I was just going to say, um, I think, like you said, sociological problems are very complex, you know, and um, I think a lot of this stems back to, I mean, the, one of the main reasons why businesses in, in the present time don't want to go to Detroit is because of the criminal activity. And it wasn't like that when all the businesses were flourishing. And then after the civil rights movement, we had white flight. All the businesses left, all the money was sucked out. And of course, if you do that in any type of socioeconomic system, 
there's massive stratification of wealth, there's scarce resources, and people are going, I mean, there's gonna be conflict that arises. So, like, I think this is a deeper sociological question about, in my opinion, because I think Michigan, specifically, is probably one of the most segregated states in the country. Sure. There's, there's underlying systemic issues of racism, and that's one of the main reasons why Detroit has failed, and some place like Chicago hasn't. And I think, you know, like if you're talking about like, like you said, starting a business there, you know, obviously it's risky because of the criminal activity. Well, why doesn't the state understand these sociological issues? Why don't they subsidize some aspects of risk until a business gets on its on its feet, right? If someone did that, like you're opening a, a Whole Foods store or whatever, and the state said, hey, we'll subsidize based on whatever standard, why isn't the state doing it? So these are like, these are systemic questions about structures in our society. Why isn't Detroit being helped, but Iraq is, or other places are. I think it's a. I think there's deeper. There's deeper social issues there. It's just unfortunately in the way that you know the American economy works. It's we're not going to do anything. We're not going to put any risk unless, of course, it's it's by you know near future is, is going to be profitable. It's just the way it is, and unfortunately, like you know, you asked why why doesn't the state subsidize it? Because they don't have enough money for the stuff they want to do already, or you know they're not willing to cut out things that they have now to, to bring in new things or fund, fully fund other programs. And, and they're not the federal government; they can't just go and print money. You know they have you know they have to balance things. And unfortunately, it, it's it's at the expense of, of why do they do that with corporations? Like for instance, GE, a big massive corporation. Not only did they pay no taxes, they got subsidies. Well, wait. That's what I'm saying. Right. So that's not profitable for the state, but they do it for. Well, let me. Um, white people get wait, 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 wait. Let's let's wait, 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 wait. I want to get I want to get this one point and then kind of move to the next point. But like I said, I, I like that this discussion is. I like this that this discussion is popping a lot of things into you guys' mind and you can speak about it. Uh, a lot of everything you're saying are thoughts that I've had too. I do. What's your name? Chelsea. In some ways, I agree with you. It's the consumer's option. But at the same time, I do agree with, what's your name? Todd. Todd's point that if, if that option as a consumer takes you so far out, out off track, then you're in the rock and a hard place. Mm -hmm. And if I did have to decide on probably to open up a dialysis center, to invest in a dialysis center in Detroit, or invest in a vegan restaurant, I am probably going to put, if I got $100,000, 90000 in the dialysis center and 10 in the vegan restaurant. Idealistically, I want that vegan restaurant to do well. But substantially, I'm probably betting on what I think is more of a sure bet. And that right there, as Todd said, I do believe in some ways, maybe I won't use the term exploitation as much as it's leveraging your profits. So that leveraging your profits, a sad thing about it is a lot of people fail in that. You got a point? Yeah, uh, I think that a lot of this has, as Todd said, to do with uh, political power. Mm -hmm. Because these big corporations, not just the healthcare system, but also the uh, restaurants like KFC and all those fast food chains, they have all that money. And they can probably eat up all the advertising airwaves so that any wholesale restaurants, they might not be able to get their message out to tell the people that they need to go and get healthier and all that stuff. So the people themselves, as I mean, lots of people make this point, I mean, they're used to the lifestyle and it's, and as uh, Dr. Hansen said at the beginning of the class, it's a path of least resistance which people inherently want to follow and it's when when you've been when when you're like 400 pounds, it's not easy for you to just get up and start ex exercising. And when you've been eating the same um, unhealthy food for 30, 40 years, it's going to be really hard to adopt your lifestyle to take on a health. I mean, it, it can still be done, but based on the history of like how these people have been acting like the psychology of humans in general, will they actually take time and energy and money to adopt a healthier lifestyle? This, even if the 
uh, new, healthier um, restaurants or grocers, no matter how much they advertise, will they be able to convince these people to go on the harder uh, path of more resistance, basically? And let me, and one second, I want to go to the next point, and I'll just point on you okay. on my next point and hopefully you have something to add what's your name okay, Shelby Shelby hopefully Shelby I'll have something and Liz I'm gonna put you out on this next point now this is we talk about the consumer's option when my brother on his knuckles blew his bell out now we looking for a hustle 100k in a year gets spent like nothing how we grew up we just used to the struggle um from 2005 to 2007 many of the auto companies Auto manufacturers and companies connected to the auto manufacturers offer a lot of their employees cash buyouts. My, my brother received $95,000, got outside of his employment contract, bought out of his employment contract. Within two years, nothing. This is, like I said, a common economic principle, marginal propensity to consume, the consumption value, $95,000. Never sat and looked at a check for $95,000. But when he looked at a check for $95,000, he's not saying to himself, all right, <clears throat> you know what? 40% is probably going to be taxes. Federal government. Mm. 15 to 20 may go state. So let's put that to the side and let's take the rest of this and have this wealth develop. A lot of that money from those cash buyouts that were offered to many of the people that I know, even though that they were what would be considered middle class based on the type of money that they make. I don't know how you define your class system. I'm just going by the ABC American method of if you make over this much amount of money, then you're considered middle class. Those middle class people spent money like they were low class Americans because their propensity to consume was high. I'm using my brother, for example, and other people that I know. Now, I don't have any stats on outside of that, but, but there were journalists that followed the trend and the storyline of so many of the blue collar workers that took the buyouts and spent a lot of that money in those three casino space. Now, Chelsea, this is another example of if I'm the casino, I can't wait till you get a cash buyout, <laughs> right? Now, if I'm the city of Detroit, it helps. It helps some. The city of Detroit does receive monies from the casinos for being in the city of Detroit. Those tax dollars, it's other programs that the casino helps the city of Detroit with. Now, if I'm the Detroiter, that situation caused a lot of I personally feel unbalanced in a lot of families. A lot of unbalanced just based on the fact that a lot of people didn't know how to take on $120,000, $80,000, $75,000 because they've never seen a check for that much money. Me personally, doing business, I've seen, let's say the biggest check that I've seen was for $17,000. Now of that $17,000, there's so many people that had to get paid and I had the honor to make that money. I personally feel like it really wasn't worth it. I'm happy that I went through the experience and hopefully in the future I'm going to go through experiences like that again. But it was a lot, personally. That's how I looked at it. But sometimes people aren't as reflective. Not to mention that a lot of the people that have blue collar work, uh, not putting blue collar employees in a box or anything, but a lot of people with blue collar work don't necessarily have... The, the business minds or the economic minds of someone in white collar work or somebody that just takes on that discipline would have. You know, that marginal propensity to spend, to consume and spend is very high. Uh, they call it a low class syndrome. Some people say it may be in black communities. I just think that it's not as much of the class as much as the understanding of money and how money works and the concept of it. A lot of people, if you've never really seen that much money, you will take for granted what's taxes, how to reinvest, and then people can exploit you too. You know, uh, some of the people I know were chasing down economic economic advisors. Anybody ever met an economic advisor in here? Okay. Now, 
If you've met an economic advisor, some of them can be great. <laughs> some of them can be great for you. Right? They could, be, they could be great, but just not great for you. And some of them just not, they, they need to get in a new, a new business. <laughs> right? So um, this situation, I believe, these cash buyouts is a perfect example of where the customer and the consumer had some faith that they could have done something with. And in many situations of the people I personally know ended up in worse situations two, three years down the line. So, Going straight to you, Shelby. Um, as far as this, I'm just would think about the values that people have instilled, uh, like in urban neighborhoods. For instance, uh, like a suburban area. This is a very deep uh, example, so just bear with me. If a uh, if you're in a suburban area and you're going somewhere, like we're going to Florida, a lot of people in suburban area just take what they already have, and particularly Caucasian people, we'll take what we have. We'll just put our flip-flops on, and it really doesn't matter how we live in Florida. Mm -hmm. But people in that type of uh, environment, since they're not very used to anything, I need to go out and get these new shoes for the trip, and I need to get this, I need to get that. It's just the way they spend their money. They, the people in the suburban uh, suburban area are going to have a good time. The uh, people in like an urban area, or people that aren't used to anything, are just going to look good. And I just feel like that's just like a small example of how people spend their money and how they, just because they're not used to things, how they do budget their money. Sociologists and economists come together and they study that on that chart just to know a person's marginal propensity to spend. Black people have a very high, almost to the point of sociologists believe if you give a black, the average black family $100, It'll probably be spent within days. Within days, so I say. So you say that that day, yeah. And, and I've I've worked like that where I've worked jobs before. I hate jobs, but if you work jobs, more power to you. But where I'll, I'll have I'll have in mind my check and have spent my check in my mind before I even get my check. Where it's like I got to pay this bill, then I got to do this, and then I got to let them borrow some money, then I got to do this. Next say to Rob and Peter to pay Paul. In my mind, I've spent money before I've even had money. When I do business, over time, I've gotten better at it. I do not think like that. I do not think like that. I see cash as a resource, not as a necessity. All right, can you, um, I, you know, can you explain how uh, being an entrepreneur has changed from having a job and a paycheck? Uh, <laughs> to, how, how you would spend the money? I'm just curious, uh, you know, like... Say you get a thousand dollars for something that you've done, and it's a cash resource now. How are you going to spend it differently than the way you would as an individual? Maker? <clears throat> Great point. In business, this is how I look at things. There are two commodities: cash and time. I'm going to have one of them. I'm going to have one of them. And I actually think time is a better resource than cash, personally, because I think if I can sit down in a room. I'm going to come up with a great plan. I'm, I'm not losing when it comes to making a plan. And I work off of leverage. I'm, I'm, I'm old school economics. I'm old school entrepreneurship. When I say leverage, I go into meetings, and the first thing I'm thinking when I go into any business meeting is what leverage do I have on this person? Before, when I used to walk into business meetings, I would think, man, I really want to do something with this person. They have whatever venue I'm trying to get to, or they have money, or they have the artists that I'm trying to get to. I don't think like that. I think you'd say it's almost a false sense or cockiness or false sense of confidence or whatever, but I'm thinking complete leverage. You know, almost to the point where I, it's, it's sometimes I'll go into a business meeting and I'll create an imaginary third party, which is still me, so that I can get some money out of a party. So... As an entrepreneur, I think every dollar I spend, because that's more of a scarce resource, I should get double value from it. Meaning that if I have $100, you tell me, Kari, I'm going to print up your posters for $100. I want to make sure that I'm going to get $100 of value in the poster and whatever you're going to do with the poster. So then it comes to the, hey, you got a website, man. You're going to post this up on your website. You, you, can you do that for me? 
Can you put this up in uh, some of the bathrooms around some of the restaurants you go to? Can you, can you do this? And then I, I try to leverage that out. Now, it's still a scientific formula that I have in my computers and kind of in my mind that I say like, okay, what can get this $100 worth of value on top of the $100 that I'm spending? So that if I spend $100, it's like I'm spending, I'm getting $200 worth back. And that's what I'll try to say to myself. So if I spend money with you, I eventually say to myself, all right, I'm going to end up getting it back two times over. Now, that same philosophy has ended up hurting me in, as well. But to right now, that's, that's what I go into. And like I say, the third party scenario, I do that often. I go into a business meeting. Like, let's say Dr. A is, uh, Dr. De A, I'm pulling him to get some contract from the university or something. I do graphics. I also do PR. I'll say, for this, I'm going to still do the PR, but I'm going to hire, what's your name again? Wes. Wes? I didn't even get your name. I'm going to hire Wes to do all the PR. I'm going to give Wes $1,000. I need you to commit to give her $500, right? So will I really give Wes $1,000? I really think that I put in $1,000 worth of effort, but Wes is still working with me. So now I've paid her through paying you which is still a percentage is going to come back to me. And plus that commits you to doing things too. I strongly agree that if you're going to get into any business partnership, somebody has to put skin on the table. When I say skin, they got to put something in on it. They got to put some money in on it or some time or some type of resource. If somebody's doing business with you and all they're offering is ideas, as much as I love ideas and intellectual capital, it's great. They got to put something in. I think money is the best thing if they're outside, the, outside of you. Money's the best thing for them to put up. And then I can start taking you seriously. If you're not talking about money, it's hard to take seriously. Wes? So, like, all these financial lessons you've learned through experience and uh, trial and error and that sort of thing. And, like, um, I know me personally, like, I've had my dad post financial journals on my dresser since I was seven. But, like, people in Detroit, they're not, like, the example with your brother, he was never taught what to do with his money, so how, like, how is that situation going to um, correct itself? Yeah, where they need to be educated, like, either through the workplace, you know, their employers need to, you know, they need to be taught how to spend their money correctly and to not be just blind consumers, and, um, or either do it through experience like you have, but I just don't, I don't know how that's going to happen. This is also a discussion when you talk about the pro athletes often. Many of the pro athletes, five, six years after they're done making millions of dollars, are bankrupt. You know, so you say, man, how can you make $50 million over seven years for paying baseball and then six years down the line not have any money, right? A lot of it, it you could say a state family. As you say, like it could be the family, it could be whatever reasoning. This is where I, I kind of lean with Chelsea and Wes. You have to be smart. Money's a resource, like any other resource. And if you don't know how to use it, you're not going to get the most from it. You're not going to profit from it. If I give you three hundred thousand years of corn, you may say, "What am I going to do with this corn?" If you know how to use corn, you'll say, "Oh man, thank God you gave me this." <laughs> And that's how I look at money. I don't look at it like, okay, cash is everything. I look at it as this is a resource. What do I need this resource to do? And that's really behind what you see with money. But I believe that a lot of people not in business, and this isn't just low-class people. This could be even somebody kid or upper class. If, you don't, if you're not a business person, I don't think you look at money as a resource. I think you look at money as like a commodity. Like, I need to have money. I don't see it like that. I say money can create this, so I should have money. I need money when I need to create this. But I would rather have this for what would be considered a barter or for free or for less. Whatever I want to get the most value in whatever that is. You know? Question point. Um and I totally like I totally agree with you saying, like, I mean obviously you have to be wise with your money, that's pretty pretty simple. But like how does this apply to like someone who's impoverished or poor, who, I mean, like, you gotta pay rent, you gotta buy food, I mean, these are necessities. You gotta pay for transportation. And let, 
Like for instance, my dad, he uh, I think he made like uh, he invested in emerging markets, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. He got up to like 13 or 14k, but then the crash wiped them out. So it's like, I mean, is it really possible for these people? Are there other reasons why these people are poor? Besides, oh, they're not wise with money, or is it just re really these people are really poor? They don't have that much money to begin with, so this is kind of somewhat unrealistic. Okay. I mean, someone with a million dollars, obviously, they can afford to take a bigger risk. They can make more mistakes. They're probably going to have. No. This is this is generally the discussion that myself and Doctor A would go back and forth about, and this is what I would say to that. Realize, I grew up in a home with entrepreneurship all around me. So I think yeah. business. So because I think business, I can conceptualize and I try to identify with other thoughts, period, and perspectives. But I know that I'm going to lean towards that way. I don't believe that they're even bad with money. I just think that they don't see money the way that I see money. And I personally think if you're Whatever level, if you're in America, I don't think it's even about being poor. It's just as important to have a concept that money is a resource if you're rich or you're poor. Because I believe if you have less of that resource, then what else can you leverage to get the other resources that you need to bring into the home? I don't have money. I have that other resource, time. What am I doing with my time? You say that I need to work, I need to pay rent, I need to do this, I need to do that. How much of my time am I really leveraging to get the most of those other things? Is there any way while I'm working or paying rent that I can leverage more of what I need? Can I get a green garden in my backyard? You know, can I um, can I figure out some way of making sure that I get the most out of the energy consumption inside my house? Can I by using plastic bags? By using styrofoam, by using wood, is there any way that I can uh, reuse some of the goods in my house so that I can get double value out of certain that I use? So I think that all levels, whether upper class or lower class, just Americans itself, money is not looked at as a resource here. It's looked at as the commodity. Because this is a consumer-based place. So as consumers, that's what we drink. Consumers don't see money as a resource. They see money as this is access. This is accessibility to whatever I need to get to. If I don't have a lot of money, I don't have enough money, I'm going to sit, you know, 100 seats back from the front row. And if I got a lot of money, I'm going to sit front row and center. But they're not saying to themselves, like, okay, hold on. What else could I do with this? How can I how can I make it stretch? Uh, there are books now on um, it's called this concept called the free economy, where a lot of people are trying to look at free markets and more barter systems and living off less and solar energy, green energy. Ty spoke to some of that things, but it takes a, a time that you have to put into education. Now, if you don't allow yourself that time, if you don't have the luxury of providing that time, then you're probably going to be like the hamster on the wheel and it'll keep going round and round and round. So I don't have an answer necessarily if you're that hamster on the wheel, but I do think that if you can leverage, if you don't have time, if you don't have money, you should have time. And if you don't have time, you should have money. And somewhere within there, you should get some type of equilibrium. If you don't have both, 